I'm going to talk a little bit about thorium health physics. And these two pictures are from Fernal, the uh, Fernal Management on your Cincinnati, which happened to be the Department of Energy uh, legacy management. And all of the thorium with the Department of Energy were part of the weapons program. It ended up in, in the Fernal uh, to be basically the, the repository. They put them in barrels. And uh, the barrels leaked and things like this. And so they had a big re uh, repackaging uh, process. And so people were, uh, had to monitor and had to suit up like this way to, 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 to deal with the thorium here. We're MSG and Associates. Uh, we're, uh, we've been in business uh, for since uh, about 27 years. Uh, I started the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory in 1959. Whoa. <laughs> do I look 77? Yes, I do. That just shows you radiation is good for you. I mean, all right. <laughs> oh, I did something here. Okay. <laughs> we had a quite a large staff. Part of the, we were part of the weapons program. Part of the, I was part of the weapons test program. And so uh, we had about, right now we have about 15 what I consider senior technical staff here, offices across the country. Most of our people come from the national labs. We either worked at Lawrence Livermore Lab, Los Alamos, uh, Argonne National Laboratory, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Rocky Flats, Hanford, places like that, Fernal, that actually dealt with the material here. So uh, what, uh, we are expertise in uh, health physics, radiation protection, and primarily uh, criticality to uh, anything dealing with uh, nuclear, nuclear safety here. Uh, we work for both the government. You know, we have contracts with Center for Disease Control. It's one of the things I'm going to talk about. Uh, we have a work with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the national labs, and we work with private industry. Matter of fact, we're working with a company right now working on uh, spent fuel storage, uh, some of the issues that are showing up in spent fuel storage. Open Yucca Mountain now. I mean, okay. <laughs> uh, the goal of this talk is to discuss uh, historical interests in thorium and uh, introduce some of the health physics issues relating to specifically of handling thorium, okay? Again, I say, not a showstopper, but let's talk about it. And I want to pass on some related experiences, uh, not only personally, of handling significant quantities of thorium and uranium-233. Okay? Let me go to the next slide here. Well, as you all, many of you know, uh, the AEC, in his infinite wisdom in the Department of Energy many years ago, uh, had an interest, actually, in developing a molten salt thorium reactor. That was one of the first concepts for this particular reactor, to go ahead and put a thorium blanket in there. However, as you want, this is the picture on the top one. You guys have seen a lot of it already. It is the molten salt reactor building at uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. But the interest was just not in nuclear power. That was not the primary interest. It was funded you know, by the department, AEC, at that time. And there was certainly weapons applications for it here. The bottom left is a shot uh, for called Teapot, part of the Met Test series in 1955. I was not there, but uh, certainly shortly thereafter. This used uranium-233 as a fuel. There has been several events personally involved that we actually put together U-233 and shot it, okay, and executed the event. It's called a device, not a weapon. You know, I've seen some articles that said, it's, can I make it into a weapon? It's probably, we have never done that, but we certainly have done it in, in a device. The next one I think is of interest here. I think I stole that from one of your slides here, John. Um, got to keep track of this one here. Um, the uh, Department of Energy um, was uh, very interested in uh, disposing of some of the legacy 232, 232 material. In this bottom picture, they spent a lot of money, 17, 20 million dollars, just to move it from Fernal and, and bury 7 million pounds of thorium, thorium nitrate, at the Nevada test site. Wow, you know, that's a lot of stuff here. It can really supply a lot of many, many years of uh, nuclear energy if we ever convert this into usable uh, energy. I want you to remember this picture because we know where it is. Okay? <laughs> and if we ever want to go back and get it, we can do that. Okay? It's there. That's a good thing. So we just didn't get rid of it. It is there. Okay? Retrievable? Okay, I hope so. But maybe it's not. There's also the Department of Energy and his wisdom <laughs> is spending up over... $500 million, well over $500 million, to destroy 450 kilograms of uranium-233. Should I say that again? <laughs> yeah, I mean, 
infinite wisdom, our good, our good, our government. You know, it's uh, you mean two, three, three, we got to get rid of it. Let's down blend it, whatever the case may be, so we cannot be used for a, 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 a device or a weapon again. Well, misthinking. You could certainly use it for other things, certainly the application that you people are thinking of here, and certainly it can be used to generate uh, Bismuth 213 for cancer research, and, and, and primarily as a prime for an entire fleet of liquid fluorine thorium reactors. I think you've heard that before. Okay, next slide. There's a story coming together here. Well, this is probably, I added this slide at the end. This is kind of a sensitivity issue. Uh, in about year 2000, there was a proposal that said, oh God, we have all these old former atomic workers, you know, back in Savannah River, Oak Ridge, Rocky Flats, they're coming down with cancer, you know, and, and it must be due to the radiation, right? So there was a compensation program to get together, administered by HSS, Human Health Services, through CDC, through National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, and through the Department of Labor. That's why you see NIOSH, Depart DOE, and Department of Labor, to set up a compensation program to compensate people who came down, who were coming down with cancer due to radiation worker as a Cold War World War worker. I'm one, okay? I don't want to come down with cancer, so I don't want to be compensated. Well, anyway, what's interesting part of it is that, what well, this is a part of the story that I wanted to tell, is that um, the, when we first looked into it, uh, he said, oh, gee, there's not that many people with a high amount of radiation uh, throughout the AEC and DOE. So if you really look at the probability of causation, there was a formula developed by the National Academy of Sciences that said, you need to get this much radiation for that particular organ, then it reaches certain level or certain probability of, of coming down with cancer. So every organ had a different number. Interestingly, you say, okay? As you all know, there's a latency period primarily with uh, getting radiation and coming down with cancer. I remember an old story, somebody told me, Mel, if you get cancer, 105, congratulations. I mean, you know, so, right. So this compensation, now remember, this is a compensation, it's a, it's a framework that they wrote down to try to get people to get compensated. It was $150,000 per person, by the way. Okay, and a compensation decision required that you had the ability to do dose reconstruction at a, at a significant accuracy. Significant accuracy? What does that mean? Right? <laughs> as your significant and my significant is two things. Also, in, in put into this particular legislation was the ability that your ancestors can, not, if you died of cancer working at Oak Ridge, but your ancestors could also compensate for you. So my grandfather worked in Oak Ridge or Y12, and we didn't know what he did, but he died of cancer. Compensated. Right. Wow. Well, so they go through a whole process of how to do dose reconstruction. We get all the data. We look you guys up. We looked them up. It says, oh, yes, he worked in this particular building for this amount of time. It's bad. Shows so much. What else did he work with? Well, he worked with uranium and plutonium and thorium. And thorium. Well, this is where it got a little bit more complicated here, okay? Remember I said, you got to, you got to able to do dose reconstruction for a significant ac sufficient accuracy. Reconstructing thorium dose proved to be the most challenging. Why? Well, I'll, talk about, I'll tell about why, but that's a real key statement. People who work with thorium and uh, w was potentially exposed to thorium, maybe the air sampler showed up, we couldn't see it very well, I'll talk a little bit about that very well, but the ability to do dose re thorium dose reconstruction to sufficient accuracy by some panel that was going to review it to make that decision was eligible for compensation. So external radiation became not the real issue, all the internal radiation became an issue here for people who even come in contact with thorium. Well, many of the people, especially at Oak Ridge, I was at Oak Ridge Bank in the early 60s and watched them actually process thorium and thoria. There was a lot of material coming through with them, machining it and doing all kinds of things and, and uh, arc welding, doing all kinds of things with it. And so, yeah, well, could you do dose reconstruction? Let me tell you why it was so hard to do. No questions so far, huh? Well, I'm glad somebody brought a piece of thorium with them. I think it was back there with a Geiger counter, right? Yeah, Alex is just passing it around. All you young guys here uh, don't know. I will tell you that's another story. <laughs> All right, thank you. It's barely radioactive. 
When I first got to Livermore, and we were getting pieces of thorium in there, we put it in a plastic bag and a hood, and that was about enough. Left it on the table here while we were working the parts. Well, it is barely radioactive. Yep. Well, just in relative numbers, thorium-232, it's about three times less than uranium-238, about 200,000 times less radioactive than plutonium per unit uh, quantity, okay? okay? That's the real key. This is back, this is grams. I'm going to give you some, um, a few uh, health physics terms here. I lose the style. Oh, yeah. The health physics term is, uh, <laughs> as health physicists are our own worst enemy, we have changed units in radiation many, many times. You know, there's 50 year committed doses, there's Baccarels, there's Sieverts, there's <laughs> Terra Baccarels, and, uh, and you know, Curies. I think you guys remember what Curies were? Okay, yeah. do you remember that one? That one. But did you ever get to Baccarels? Then we had Sieverts, now we got Gray. How about just Millerim? I mean, you know, give me a break. Right? Well, not only we confuse ourselves, we confuse everybody else too, right? So when you go up and I said, oh, you just got so many Sieverts or Milli Sieverts. My God, that's got to be bad, right? Because I didn't understand what the unit was. Well, I just want to brought that up here. Okay, that's an issue. We are our own, our own worst enemy. Thorium does pack a little bit of a punch. And here's part of the story. It starts off with thorium-232. Alpha decays with a very long half-life, 10 to the 10th year. Somebody knew that number very well at the lunch table here. It's about three times the age of the Earth. Well, how can it be three times the age of the Earth? But it is, okay. That's what the decay is. It decays down to radium-228, and it has several, what, five short uh, half-lives of, of, uh, of decay here. Primarily, mostly alpha decays, but through beta beta chain here. It comes all the way down. I think if I push the button, it gives a little ring hang up in there. Oh, yeah, it just brings a circle. Oh, how glitzy is that, huh? Thank you, Brent. Anyway, it comes down the uh, thorium-228 chain. I want to point out the thorium-228 very clearly. That's the culprit. When we were dealing with uranium-233, uranium there was a trace quantity of uranium-232. And that uranium-232's first daughter is thorium-228. Okay? But it's also one of the daughters for, uh, for thorium-232. Well, let's follow down the, the alpha decay chain here. It goes down to radium, another short, short, short half-life. Then it breaks up right at business here and breaks apart but by an alpha decay down to a thallium-208 and a polonium-212. Well, the reason I bought up thallium-208, that's the culprit. That has a very large gamma of 2.6 MeV. I think many of you guys know that already because we talked about uranium-232 and, and thorium-232 and as part of the decay chain. But it takes a little while to get there. But the real issue is that if it has a contaminant of 232, which when we were working on some of the weapons program, it did have that contaminant. And that particular contaminant was very deal, difficult to deal with, but we only did with, deal with it a very short time, and we just watched it grow in and then blew it up. Okay, that's what we did. Literally blew it up. Detecting thorium intake, that's breathing it. That's not that big chunk you're talking about. Pretty hard to swallow that big chunk you had in your hand there. But you break it up in little pieces, or you start machining it, you gotta do it. This is the front end of the fuel cycle. If it's in the front end of the fuel cycle, you are potentially dealing with the spur fine chips or powders and things like this. Therefore, it could be an inhalation hazard. It does take it. You can do it. A few people in the atomic energy in, in, uh, work with DOE and the weapons program did, did inhale some thorium. Hard to see, though. Couldn't quantify it very well because the only way we couldn't see it through urine. We couldn't see it through uh, the feces. Number one, it's so low specific activity, and once it got into the lung, it kind of stayed there. You know, it's highly insoluble, and just kind of stayed in the lung here. We even tried lung counting. We spent a mobile laboratory up to Fernal, we set it up at Y12 to see if you can see the, some of the daughters and see the gammas. Well, it obviously depends when the thorium was separated. You know, there's a very complex decay chain with thorium once you do thorium separation. I won't go into that. That's a whole other talk in itself. But you had to know exactly when the thorium was, when you detect it, and when they were de dealing with it. That also made it very, very difficult. And the only way you can really do uh, a, a good an assessment of what uh, the exposures were is probably by air sampling or by uh, sampling of the lapel. All of these tubes are very uh, too insensitive. That became the issue. That became the issue with the compensation, that we were un had the inability 
to do submit, uh, accuracy of thorium exposures to sufficient accuracy. And it was to form the basis for the compensation. Well, how many have there been? Okay. Well, they, the way the law was written, if anybody even had potentially come in, in contact with thorium, they walked into the building and somebody was machining a p piece of thorium down the hallway here, he was eligible for compensation. Right? Wow. You know, well, I have to say this with um, a little bit of care. I think that's what the government wanted. You know, I mean, that's what the, the government wanted. They wanted to compensate the people just to get, say that, yeah, we took care of the legacy of the old Cold War war warriors. And so they developed a presidential panel uh, and, and able to make some of these particular compensation decisions. It's been going on for about 15 years, really 10 the last strong when we got the system going and go back and look at all the records and see what people, who was working with radiation. The program has now exceeded $9 billion. We've already spent $9 billion compensating. You not only get $150,000, but you also, if you happen to be still alive, you get your medical included too. Okay? Wow. So what does it do here? My message is, John, is that it's give the people the wrong impression. Okay? I just got compensated because I, was, I walked into the building with thorium, and that's how I got cancer. Well, <laughs> okay. You can shake your head, obviously no on that one, right? You know, how, how can that be? Okay. Well, it is because the way the legislation was written. Exposure issues with the thorium fuel cycle. Just want to make sure we know it, and I hope we get a chance to do it. I applaud this particular group together to post a, put a program together with objectives and your goal to get fuel uh, thorium into uh, thorium reactors, your energy as an energy source, part of the fuel cycle. I love to be part of it again. This is the Mali core and the Mali core, they have a lot of rare earths. But they, as you well know, know rare earths comes along with thorium. That's where you find thorium, you find rare earths and vice versa. It's a real nuisance to them. Matter of fact, the president of Raleigh Molly Course called me several times and just kind of cornered me, Mel, can you figure a way to get rid of the thorium? Any one of you guys want to buy it? Can you, do you have any contacts for somebody who'll take it? I know, I think we just buried it. You know, we just can't, get, we're trying to get rid of it. It's, it's a real nuisance. But it is, for the people who are at Molly Corps, it does represent a somewhat of a potential exposure. Not big, but it is a potential, okay? Now, this is a picture of the molten salt reactor. Unfortunately, you know, we thought of using thorium, but because of they were more interested in the neutronics, they end, never end up actually putting a thorium blanket around there, but they did use 233. The 233 was made in uh, Savannah River in Hanford, so they used it directly. But the application is here. We had a lot of trouble getting this, dismantling this thing here. So that's another message I want to give. To take apart a thorium U-233 uh, reactor, we've got to be careful if we, I hope we get there, right? I hope we get a chance to do that one of these days, that the radiation issues along with the 232 uh, and the gammas from the, and the fission products and things like this is going to represent a radiation exposure. I hope I get a chance to do it again, okay, with the eyes. Anyway, in conclusion, thorium is not very radioactive. Five short half-life alpha emitters, packs a little bit of punch. Thorium will stay in the lung after inhalation. Detecting thorium intakes is a very challenging. External 232 are significant. Unfortunately, this is red. Health physics issues and radiological controls will need to be appropriately addressed in the thorium fuel cycle and the reactor designs. Especially if we can want to make sure we think about this, especially in designing the reactors and also the follow on, if we ever have to decommissioning it, the back end of the fuel cycle, it's going to represent some real fun time for health physicists again. Thank you very much. We've got time for, you got one question, right? What would thorium cost to acquire? They, we, somebody, if you have a way to store it, you could make a lot of money because people would pay you to take, take it. Take it, exactly. Yeah, exactly. it's garbage. It's less than worthless. It's, people would. <laughs> At one time, we were, we were able to, you could buy it and uh, very, very inexpensively. And I remember uh, when I was at Livermore, we got a call from this one person. Uh, he said, you need to come to my house because I got a bunch of thorium that I had bought and it was sitting in his backyard in the tub. And I remember that. <laughs> and so, uh, what can I say? We, All right. Unfortunately, we didn't want to take it because we had cost of money to get rid of it. <laughs> Thank you very much.